these plants? That's right, they're dill. And without them, there wouldn't be any dill pickles. This is basil, a great addition to any salad. And over here, oregano. What would pizza and Italian spaghetti sauces be like without oregano? All these plants have distinctive flavors and many uses. You see, this is an herb garden. And everyone who enjoys gardening, especially vegetable gardening, is missing out on a lot of great flavors if they don't have one. Learn how to grow your own herb garden today on The Joy of Gardening. I'm Dave Schaefer, your host for The Joy of Gardening. You know, once you learn a few basics about the cooking herbs, you open up a fascinating world. Every cook has a favorite herb. And when I visit a house and see an herb garden at the kitchen door, I try to get invited back for dinner because I know some great things are going to be coming out of that kitchen. Today, Mark Hebert is here to help get us started with a basic herb garden. Hi, Mark. Hi, Dave. Mark, there are so many kinds of herbs. Uh, where do we begin? And are they hard to grow? No, not at all. Most people are surprised at just how easy herbs are to grow. In fact, some are just weeds with some special characteristics. And it seems that most herbs have some sort of legend attached to them. There are hundreds of different herbs, some with exotic names and uses. Have you ever heard of mugwort? It says here in olden days it was used to ward off wild beasts and evil spirits. Well, I'm not superstitious, so today, we're going to stick with the more familiar ones you probably have right in your kitchen, like dill. The leaves, stems, flowers, and seeds can all be used to flavor soups and stews. And of course, it's essential for pickles. This is oregano, and for me, it's what puts the Italian in tomato dishes. Thyme is great for meats, chicken, and stuffing, and it attracts honeybees to the garden. And parsley is everybody's favorite garnish but dried or fresh from the garden. It can really perk up a soup. I'm gonna grow these four, plus basil, chives, marjoram, mint, rosemary, sage, savory, and French tarragon. These are the herbs we use most for cooking around my house. If you're gonna buy them and use them, why not grow them yourself? Now, you may wanna grow some others, but as usual, I recommend looking at your garden on paper before you plant it. Here's my herb garden. Really, it's just a patch. There aren't even any walkways because I don't need them. Everything's easily accessible from every side. And like vegetables, remember to keep your taller growing herbs toward the back so they don't shade the others. The rest are here, planted in small bunches. It's handy this way, and I think it's attractive. So, let's get started. An herb garden doesn't need to take up much space. In fact, mine will contain 12 different herbs and takes up just 32 square feet, the size of a sheet of plywood. How much room will you need? Well, that depends on what and how much you grow. But generally, if you allow one square foot per plant, you'll have ample space. For most families, just two or three plants will provide a generous harvest. So you see, there's room for herbs in every yard. Like any garden, good results begin with the soil. But many herbs are very forgiving. They remind me of weeds and will thrive in remarkably poor conditions. Any type of soil will support a good crop of herbs. Sand, clay, whatever you have, as long as it's loose, well-drained, and of course, rich in organic matter. Most herbs prefer full sun, and this spot offers me just that. But as long as your location gets five or six hours of sunlight a day, you can grow a healthy crop of herbs. In a small herb garden, Forget about planting in rows. Instead, think in terms of clusters, little colonies of similar plants. This informal arrangement is pleasing to look at and makes harvesting and tending easy. Dill is an excellent example of an herb that can be grown from seeds planted right in the garden. Dill seeds are fairly large and easy to handle, 
and they'll sprout quickly if the soil temperature is above 60 degrees. Dill doesn't transplant well, so I'm going to broadcast the seeds in sort of an oval here at the back side of my patch. Cover the seeds with about a quarter inch of soil and pat it down. When they're up, I'll thin so plants are about four inches apart. Mature dill will stand three or four feet tall, making a lovely yellow-green background. This small block in my herb garden keeps it handy for garnishing and flavoring, but I really love dill pickles, so I've got a patch as big as this garden planted by my cucumbers. I think setting out transplants is the fastest and easiest way to get an herb garden going. Like some vegetables, some herbs benefit from a head start indoors. Thyme seeds are minute grains that require warm, 70 degree soil temperatures in order to germinate. So I start them inside and set them out as transplants. Parsley can be sown outdoors, but I always start some inside too, because parsley can take five or six weeks just to germinate. By starting some inside, I can start harvesting two months earlier. Transplanting is easy. Just open a planting hole, you can use your hands, and slip in a plant. Set it at the same depth it grew in its container. Firm it in, and that's it. Whenever you're using transplants of any kind, they should be hardened off before setting them into the garden. Set them in a protected location for an hour or so at first, and increase the amount and length of exposure each day for a week or so. Finally, leave them out all night. If frost threatens, protect the plants or bring them back inside. The third method of starting plants is called division. That's taking parts of an established plant, roots and all, and planting it in another spot. Now let's take chives for instance. My neighbor had some chives that were getting out of hand, so she let me take some from my garden. This clump will be more than enough. Now divide the mother plant with a shovel or a knife or just pull them apart. Boy, these are tough, and just look at those roots. Select healthy looking plants, like this, to start your bed. Now, trim back the tops to reduce moisture loss so the plants can reestablish themselves more easily. Before you know it, you'll be able to supply your neighbors with divisions for their chive beds. Now, I started this mint from a cutting a couple months ago. I took a six inch piece of stem from another plant and put it in a pot of moist, sterile potting mixture. I kept it warm and well watered. Roots grew quickly and look, it's ready to plant. But you know what? I'm gonna set this whole thing pot and all in the ground to try and confine it. Mint can spread like crazy and it'll take over. All these methods are fine. But if you're just starting out with a small herb garden like mine, I recommend you buy your transplants from a grower. It'll get your herb garden started quickly and inexpensively. And I'll bet that once you see how easy and how much fun it is to grow your own herbs, you'll want to try more. How's this for an attractive and functional border? I've got a whole year's supply of herbs right here outside the kitchen door. And it looks like it could use a little care, too. Weeds are probably the biggest problem. As in the vegetable and flower garden, weeds rob moisture, nutrients, and space from the herbs. A lot of these look like volunteer vegetables that I brought in with the compost. Now look, here's a squash plant. They'll grow about anywhere. And look at this. Here's a tomato. Now these would be fine in the vegetable garden, but here in these herbs, they're just weeds. Well-prepared soil will go a long way towards eliminating weeds, and so will spacing your plants close together. But even so, you know there's going to be some weeds. Here are a couple of my favorite tools that help make weeding a lot easier. This narrow-bladed hoe is called a finger hoe. This is a great tool, especially for people who have a tough time bending over in the garden. For close work, it's tough to beat this design. The three flexible tines let you dig out tough established weeds or to scratch around gently among the plants. These tools may be hard to find, but I think they're well worth looking for. 
You know, in the weed wars, the best offense is a good defense, and that means mulch. The best mulch is one you can get easily. And for me, that's pine bark. Put down a good thick layer. A lot of folks tend to be stingy, and they don't get the best benefit from their mulch. And avoid gaps. Don't give weeds a place to start. To really prevent weeds, avoid mulches that could contain weed seeds, like grass clippings, old hay, or straw. Choose weed-free mulch materials like pine needles, salt marsh hay, or bark chips. A mulch not only helps control weed growth, but can improve the appearance of your herb garden, too. It also slows the loss of soil moisture through evaporation. Once you've finished mulching, it's time to consider watering. Like all plants, herbs require a steady supply of moisture in order to grow their best. If Mother Nature hasn't been doing her share, you're going to have to help her out. Just remember, when you water, water deeply. Give the soil a good soaking. Lately, I've been using these soft, vinyl, sprinkler-type hoses for my watering. At full pressure, they provide a gentle shower, and at low pressure, a steady drip. They're an efficient way to put water where you need it. Who says a vegetable garden is just for vegetables? A lot of people like to grow a few of their favorite herbs in their gardens. I know I like to reserve a corner for some annual flowers and a few herbs, like this tall growing dill, or this vitamin-rich parsley. Look how thick that's grown. Plain or fancy, there's always room for some herbs, even on a small porch or patio. You can grow anything in containers, so why not a few herbs? Mmm, that aroma reminds me of when I was younger. It's rosemary. My family lived in Arizona, and a giant four-foot-tall rosemary bush greeted everyone by the front door. I'd always pluck off a few leaves and pop them in my mouth every time I walked past. Rosemary is a native of the warm Mediterranean, so it thrived in the Arizona sun. In northern areas, it must be protected from any frost, so growing it in a pot or container lets me bring it inside when cold weather threatens. The best part of growing your own herbs is using them. So let's take a look at what, when, and how to harvest. For the herbs I've grown here, the foliage provides the usable part of the plant. You can harvest them just about any time and use them fresh. The plants even signal the best time to harvest by producing flower buds. Harvesting should be done before the blossoms are fully open. The best time to harvest is early in the morning, after the dew is dried, but before the sun gets too hot. The stem should be cut using sharp tools. I like to use floral shears or a small pair of pruning shears. A good sharp knife works well, too. Pulling or breaking the stems can damage the plant so it won't recover and produce more. And that's what we want. If you're harvesting herbs for fresh use, like this parsley or basil, bring along several sheets of moist paper towel and wrap them up immediately after harvesting. They'll keep their just-picked flavor and appearance a lot longer that way. When I'm harvesting a lot of herbs for drying, I like to hose them off the day before. Hosing them like this washes away dirt. Use a fog-type nozzle on an extension wand. There's less bending that way. Just make sure you give them a chance to dry off before cutting. It's a lot harder to dry soggy plants. I think the best way to keep herbs is to dry them. Now, after harvesting, be sure you handle them gently. Don't crush or bruise them. That releases the oils that give herbs their distinctive flavors. And don't pile them up, either. Make sure there's plenty of room for air to circulate. Heaped up, these green herbs can heat up fast, again, losing volatile oils and flavor. Hang your herbs in small bunches in a dark, warm, airy spot to dry naturally. They'll be completely dry in just a couple weeks. Then just strip the leaves from the stem, store them in airtight containers, and enjoy your own homegrown herbs whenever you need them.
this is how your herb garden will look late in the season. Just look at this dill. By the way, dill is an annual, as are sweet basil and savory. They'll have to be planted again next year. Parsley is a biennial, but I find the second season is short and the taste is less pleasing, so I grow it as an annual too. The rest are perennials and should supply more tasty herbs for many years. Some of these, however, are very tender and won't survive the winter here. Marjoram, although perennial, will be treated as an annual. And I'll be sure to bring my prized rosemary inside for the winter. The rest will remain in the garden and return next season. Once you've tried growing these herbs, I know you'll want to try some more. With a little experimentation, who knows, maybe you'll be growing some mugwort. Once you get used to cooking with the basic kitchen herbs, it won't be long before you wish you had fresh ones as well as dried ones all winter long. And you can. Without much trouble, you can have a basic kitchen window herb garden. One way to do it is with cuttings. Cuttings are simply healthy young stems cut from a mature plant and then established in a pot. Several of the herbs lend themselves to cuttings such as basil, rosemary, oregano, marjoram, and thyme. And it's easy to do. Find some new growth and then take a three to six inch cutting above a leaf node. This is oregano. Should do well indoors. Strip the leaves off the lower one third. So you have just the top growth remaining. Now we're ready to plant. Simply make three holes here for the cuttings and dip them in this rooting powder. This contains a hormone that encourages root development and it's available at any garden store. If it doesn't stick, if it's very dry, simply moisten it a little bit before you dip it in. Now I've made a little greenhouse out of half a plastic soda bottle. There. Roots should form in about three weeks, then just transplant them into individual pots. It's better to start an indoor herb garden from cuttings rather than bring in mature plants for a couple of reasons. One is that mature plants are big and bushy, hard to handle. And the other is that the small cuttings will find it easier to adapt to life on a windowsill. It only takes a few minutes to start an indoor herb garden, and it pays off all winter long. Annuals are plants that complete their life cycle in one year. Most garden vegetables, for instance, are grown as annuals. So planting an annual flower garden is a lot like planting a vegetable garden. Both prefer rich soil, full sun, and even moisture. But flowers are planted for their visual appeal, not their food value. So you must be more aware of their color and their growth habits. When making my plan, I like to use colored pencils or markers to help me visualize how things will look. Now, here's my idea for brightening up a rather dull corner in my yard. Notice I've chosen random splashes of color rather than a more formal arrangement for interest and variety. I've got my taller plants along the fence and they descend stair fashion toward the front. If you're doing a border, do a mass planting of petunias or marigolds for a striking effect. Your annual flower garden can be ever changing with the many choices of colors and varieties available, you need never plant the same way twice. So, let's get going. I like to have color in my annual garden as early as possible. So I'm gonna start some of my seeds indoors. You don't need a greenhouse, a warm sunny window will do. But let me show you something. These are zinnia seeds. Pretty tough looking, aren't they? And they are. But these are petunia seeds. They're not much bigger than fine dust and just as delicate. Most seeds, like these zinnias, are protected with a covering of soil when they're planted. But these tiny petunia seeds must lie on top of the soil because they need light to germinate. Therefore, they're extremely vulnerable especially to drying out. That's why I start my seeds inside, where I control the environment. Here's how. First, just fill a seed flat with moist, sterile soil mix. 
level it out, and firm slightly. I use a piece of wooden shingle. Now, sprinkle the seeds onto the surface. Spacing these fine seeds can be difficult. They're even tough to see. But by tapping them gently from the packet, or by mixing them with some dry sand and sprinkling the mixture onto the soil mix, you can control the spacing pretty easily. You want a good, even stand in the flat. Firm again and slip the flat inside a clear plastic bag and seal it with a twist tie to help control the moisture. That's all there is to it. Petunias start off slowly, but they catch up fast, and they should be transplanted into other flats as soon as they're big enough to handle. In just six to eight weeks, they'll look like this. And I'll be the first to admit that raising transplants can take time and some special attention. But petunias, for example, come in every imaginable color. You can buy the common ones at your local nursery. But if you want something really unusual, you'll want to grow them yourself. It's been a long winter, and I'm ready to get planting. So let's go. I almost always like to grow my annual flowers from transplants. These cosmos and zinnias are hardened off, and they're ready for the garden. Hardening adjusts them to being outside. Just set them in a sheltered spot for a week or so before planting to toughen them up. Or use a cold frame. It's just a wooden box with a transparent cover. It provides shelter and protection at night. Here's that corner I was talking about, but it won't be dull for long. Now with my transplants, I always wait until the danger of frost has passed before setting them into the garden. I used to gamble and set some out earlier, worry about frost and hope they'd make it, only to find the ones I'd planted later had caught up with them. I've already worked the soil, so it's nice and loose. And here's a tip. I've marked the area to be planted with my rake handle according to my plan. Now, planting is quick and easy. Make a hole using a trowel or your hands that's big enough to hold the plant at the same level it grows in the flat. Give the container a good soaking and carefully remove the plants. If they're in fiber flats like this, pull the plants apart gently so you don't damage the roots. Tuck them into the hole, fill it with soil, and press them in gently but firmly. Some transplants come in six packs and they need a good soaking too. They come out easier that way. Slip the plants from their cell, taking care not to bend or crush the stem. If the roots are tight like this, loosen them a bit by scratching the root ball with an ordinary table fork. A fork is a handy tool. It's also great for lifting plants from their flats, and sometimes it serves as a small trowel. Set these in like the others and firm. Generally, I like to space plants close together, 8 to 12 inches for most. Planted in random patterns, they tie the garden together in a solid mass of colors. After planting, be sure to give them a good watering. A water-soluble fertilizer mixed with the water can help get your plants off to a healthy start. I'm going to plant my whole annual garden just like this. My annual garden is planted, and it looks pretty good, but it'll still take a while before it fills in. In the meantime, I've got to be on the lookout for weeds. Frequent shallow cultivation with a hand cultivator or a narrow-bladed hoe can make quick work of the job. Just be careful that you don't damage tender plant stems. Soon, the plants will spread out, completely covering the soil, and the weeds will have a tough time growing. Annuals are pretty undemanding when it comes to fertilizer, but to maintain their health and vigor, they should be fed once the first blooms appear. This is 5105 plant food. The numbers indicate the percentage of the three basic nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, in the fertilizer. The first number is the amount of nitrogen, and nitrogen produces lush green foliage, but that's not what we're after. The second number, 10, represents phosphorus a nutrient that's responsible for the growth of healthy roots and flowers. And that's just what we want. So when choosing a fertilizer for your flowers, look for a middle number that's at least twice as high as the first. 
This third number, five, is potassium. It supports the overall good health of the entire plant. Incidentally, these three numbers always appear in the same alphabetical order. So remember, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Natural nutrient sources like blood meal, bone meal, and green sand are also labeled in the same fashion. Whether you choose a manufactured fertilizer or one of the organic products, remember, go easy on the nitrogen. Here's how I apply it. To avoid feeding them too much, I like to spoon feed. Matter of fact, I use it to make the trench all the way around the plant. It also makes a good measure. There, just a little like this sprinkled in the trench all the way around the plant. And be sure and cover it up because we don't want the nitrogen that's in the fertilizer to splash up and perhaps burn the plant. After you've fertilized all your plants, you should water. That gets the fertilizer working right away. There are many ways to water, but in a small area like this, I prefer one of these. It's a water break attached to a wand at the end of a hose. If possible, water in late afternoon to avoid excessive evaporation. A steady supply of water is necessary, especially in late summer when large plants, sparse rainfall, and hot, dry conditions can cause plants to wilt in a hurry. Whenever you water, water thoroughly. Give it a good soaking, and check the soil several inches down to make sure you've watered enough. That looks pretty good. I've been preparing this border along the walkway, and I'm going to plant a flower garden here. But I don't want to wait for lots of color. With annuals, having an instant flower garden is not only possible, it happens all the time. It seems more and more growers are providing plants in full bloom. The same basic transplanting techniques apply. You just have to be a little extra careful. Dig a nice deep hole for the plant, and then soak the flat. Water helps soils stick to the roots and prevents the delicate roots from drying out during transplanting. Now, always get your transplants from the flat into the ground as quickly as possible. Any exposure to air will damage the roots. Then, just fern them in like you would any transplant, and be sure to water right away. You want the roots to stay good and moist. I know this soil's rich because I already worked in lots of compost. And that's good because these plants will need it. They're already in high gear. And they'll need a steady supply of nutrients to keep them growing strong and healthy. There. Only with annuals can you have a beautiful border in just 15 minutes. Remember when this beautiful spot was just a plan on paper? This just goes to show you that a little preparation is well worth the effort. Many annuals also make lovely cut flowers, so their beauty can be enjoyed indoors as well. Corn flowers, snapdragons, sweet peas, zinnias, just to mention a few, are perfect for arrangements. Harvest flowers early in the morning, after the dew has evaporated, but before the sun gets hot. Use a sharp knife or shears and cut on an angle to expose more of the stem for better uptake of water. And select blossoms that aren't fully open to extend that just picked appearance longer. If you can't arrange them right away, put them in a pitcher of water and store them in the refrigerator. They'll keep much better where it's cool. 
As you've seen, annuals are easy to plant and care for. They're versatile and colorful. They're a great way to enjoy beauty indoors and out. Give them a try. I borrowed this strange looking plant from a friend because I want to divide it and have one of my own. It's an aloe vera and it's been in use for centuries because of its medicinal properties. If you walk through a drugstore, you'll see it listed as an ingredient in all kinds of products. Suntan oil, skin cream, shampoo. People are rubbing it on, scrubbing it on, wiping it on. Some even take it internally. Here's what the excitement is all about. The gooey juice of this plant, when rubbed on a burn, sunburn, or small cut, promotes healing. It also helps prevent dryness and chapping has been used for insect bites, athlete's foot, even ringworm. It looks like a member of the cactus family, but actually it's a member of the lily family. These little suckers are called pups, and they spring up from the main stem of a well-established plant. I'm going to cut these pups off and repot them to form three new plants. We're going to repot the larger plant anyway, so let's just take it right out of here and see what we have. There are the pups, see, attached to the main stem. There, we'll just pull those right off. Okay, we'll set that aside. Let's start with this one. This already has some roots forming. We'll trim off this excess, and then just set it right into this pot, give it plenty of room here. Now, what you'll need is a well-drained potting mixture, because one thing aloe veras don't like is too much moisture, and they don't like a lot of nitrogen. You'll soon have a tough little medicinal plant that will thrive as a house plant in colder regions and as an outdoor plant in warm climates. By the way, as you use it, cut off the lower leaves and then the plant will heal itself. Not bad for such an easy plant to care for. Keep one in the kitchen window to take care of those minor cuts and burns. You'll be amazed at the result. I can't imagine spaghetti sauce without garlic, and I can't imagine my garden without garlic either because it's so easy to grow. Hi, I'm Dick Raymond, and I'm going to show you how to grow all the garlic that the cook in your house needs. All it takes is a little bit of ground and three or four garlic bulbs. You can pick them up from the local garden store or buy them at the supermarket. Each bulb is made up of many individual cloves, and each clove you plant will produce another whole bulb. The outside cloves of the garlic will usually produce the largest bulb. Plant your garlic very early in the spring. In fact, as soon as you can work the soil. Plant each clove with its root side down. Push them into the ground so the tops are just flush with the soil. Plant them three or four inches apart in all directions. I grow garlic in wide rows so I can have more plants in a small garden space. Once you've got them all planted, firm them into the soil real good. Garlic likes fertilizer, so every four or five weeks, sprinkle a little around the plants. You can pull them and store them when the tops get brown, or harvest them fresh. Ah, what an aroma. Plant garlic like this, and you'll have a year's supply of seasoning for your sauces, pickles, and all your favorite recipes. 